we were discussing uh, the frequency response of common source amplifiers that is the response of a common source amplifier including all the parasitic capacitors okay uh, we saw that there is a i think that guy's 8 o'clock is whenever that guy shows up In a MOS transistor or in any device, there will be parasitic capacitances between the terminals. Some of it is due to intrinsic nature of the device. Some of it is due to the terminals that are draw, drawn out and so on. Okay. So, in a common source amplifier, you can expect capacitors between every pair of terminals. There will be three of them. Okay. So, what we first did was... So include only two of them. We included only CGS and the load capacitance CL. Okay, and evaluated the transfer function V naught of S by VI of S. As expected, it comes out to be a second order fun transfer function and not only that, it is separable into two first order transfer functions and that part is pretty obvious from the circuit itself. There is a first order circuit between VI and VGS and another first order circuit between VGS and VO. Okay. And if you plot the magnitude response. This is of course, when I say magnitude response, it means that you have applied sinusoids and evaluated the magnitude of the sinusoid in steady state. And that is obtained by applying, I mean, substituting S equals J omega in the Laplace transform uh, transfer function. Okay. So, we have something of this sort. We will have two poles. I will assume that they are like this. One of the poles will be at gs by cgs and the other one will be at gl by cl okay and the magnitude for very low frequencies will be gm rl okay so that will be the magnitude response of the common source amplifier if you include only the gate source capacitance and the load capacitance okay and this one the first one I associate with the input because it has the conductance GS and CGS and in this circuit again it is uh, pretty obvious it is this part of the circuit that has that pole okay and this one I associate with the output node okay I have of course assumed that the pole associated with the output node is higher than that with the input node and this is arbitrary okay just for uh, illustration I was in Now, after that, we added the CGD, okay, and you evaluated the transfer function and so on. So, as far as analysis is concerned, it's yet another circuit, and it comes out, uh, it turns out to have a second-order transfer function with a zero between V naught and VI, okay. But of course, more significant is the role of CGD and uh, what happens uh, because of it, even when it is small, because of the gain of the amplifier. Okay. So, what we saw was that in this case, we have a second order uh, 
system and the poles it's quite hard to evaluate exactly unless you have numerical values in which case it's very easy so we have to resort to approximations and we saw that one of the poles i can still associate with the conductance gs and the capacitance with that turns out to be cgs plus cgd times 1 plus gm by gl plus cgd plus cl times gs by gl okay first of all this itself is an approximation this is an approximation assuming that the magnitude of the poles are uh, widely separated okay that is one pole is at a much higher frequency than the other one but it does gives us some insight into what happens you can see that you still have this gs divided by the capacitance which is cgs plus something okay and what is that so the gs of course comes from there and cgs is there now because the cgd is connected across the amplifier from the input to the output it has a sort of exaggerated effect at the input okay although cgd is small the voltage across cgd can be very large because of the amplifier so it draws a lot, lot of current so effectively it appears like a large capacitance when you see from the input side okay and this is known as miller effect which we saw yesterday if you have a negative gain amplifier with cgd across it okay then looking in here as far as the input current is concerned this is equivalent to a capacitor value cgd times 1 plus a okay and that's exactly what you see here as well the effect of cgd at the input of the amplifier is what is there okay so it makes intuitive sense of course we do have extra terms but as i said this is an approximation and so on okay there is always you can always find some value of cgd for which this will not be valid or nowhere close to reality okay in fact with the appropriate value of components you can also get complex poles in the system okay of course we are assuming real poles which are well separated so that's the story with the input pole so the point is even though it is complicated you can make some sense out of it at least in some circumstances and fortunately for us it turns out that this case where the poles are very well separated is also of great practical interest as we will see later when we study stability of feedback system okay and the second pole what was it you could still think of it as the conductance at the output node divided by the capacitance at the output node but what was the conductance at the output what did we get gl that's it what is the most dominant thing that we found yesterday gm times cgd by cgs plus cgd okay plus gl plus gs times cl plus cgd by cgs plus cgd okay then in the denominator cl plus the series combination of cgs and cgd okay okay now this also makes sense it turns out the cgd it's connected from here to there but importantly here for gm it introduces feedback okay so before this no part of this current was getting fed back to the controlling uh, side that is to vgs but now with this some of it does get fed back okay so if you made a circuit like this this is gm vgs and this is vgs cgs cgd and let's say you are looking for the impedance between this point and ground so you apply a test voltage 
of course there will be some current that flows that way ok but what is the current that flows here the lower one what is that value yeah what is it what is the voltage that appears here across CGS if you apply V test over there it is just a capacitive divider so it is V test CGD by CGS plus CGD ok and that multiplied by GM is the current over there which is GM CGD by CGS plus CGD times V test ok so if you look at the expression for this current it looks like this voltage times some number so obviously this is the equivalent conductance ok now also you have this part of it where you have CGD and CGS in series ok what is this current what is this current I have marked into the capacitors what is that value huh? what no, it is not DC. If that is 0, how did you get that other expression? What is that current? Yes, what is it? What is the current value? Yeah, I mean, we are using Laplace domain, right? Not differential equation. So, what is the this is V test of S. What is I1 of S? S times CGS CGD by CGS plus CGD times V test. Okay. I mean, it is just a, a two capacitors in series, right? You have voltage across a capacitor. What is the current? S times the capacitance times the voltage. Or is it so difficult or what is going on? So, this part of it here looks like a resistance that is whose conductance is GM CGD by CGS plus CGD and across that we have a capacitor whose value is CGS CGD by CGS plus CGD. When I say it looks like this, what I mean is if I connect V test to this, the current that is drawn out of V test here and there are exactly the same. Okay. So, because of this feedback around GM, there is an extra conductance. Before we had only GL between the output node and ground. Now, we have this extra conductance which is due to feedback around GM ok. <coughs> so, the picture looks like we have that equivalent conductance which I evaluated earlier, the series combination of uh, CGS and CGD and we also have the physical capacitance and resistance that are present that is RL and CL. Okay. Now, if you just looked at this network, where would you say the time constant was? It is the effective resistance times the effective capacitance, right? Or the pole would be effective conductance divided by the effective total capacitance, okay? And that is exactly what we see. So, this CL appears there, this equivalent capacitance is there, and this conductance is what you see there, and this is what you see over there, okay? And of course, there is some extra term. Again, I will put it down to the approximations that are made in this. Okay, and also the fact that we do have this resistance 
in drawing this equivalent picture, I omitted the resistance. Then what we get is exactly this. Okay, but we do have some resistance here, so that introduces some resistive component in the impedance as well. Okay. So again, uh, deriving the expression is one thing. Once you are told the approximation you can make with quadratic equations, that part is trivial. The more important thing is to interpret the result. Okay. So in the numerator, this tends to be the dominant term and this probably is not as dominant. Okay. So actually, because the numerator increased substantially, you expect GM after all to be much more than GL. Okay. So the second pole, the pole associated with the output moves to higher frequencies, whereas the pole associated with the input moves to lower frequencies. Okay. Now this kind of uh, uh, thing is valid in a regime where CGD is could be small, it does not have to be bigger than CGS or anything, but of course not zero, not negligibly small. Okay. So it has somewhat significant value, then it tends to dominate the picture. Okay. It also provides substantial feedback. This ratio is not a very small number. It could be, it will of course be smaller than 1, but multiplied by GM, it could be more significant compared to GL. Okay. So the result is that because of the CGD, the poles move apart, the input pole moves to lower frequencies and the output pole moves to higher frequencies. And as we see later, this is an asset while stabilizing negative feedback systems. Okay. Where else have you seen this? So let us say, even if, uh, let us imagine that without CGD, these two poles were at the same frequency. Okay. So that is, there are two systems which are uncoupled which happen to be at the same, uh, which happen to have the same uh, uh, pole value or uh, essentially, so eigenvalues, right? They are the eigenvalues of this linear system. Now, when you couple the two using CGD, the poles will move apart or the eigenvalues move apart. Have you seen this phenomenon elsewhere? So, you have uncoupled system, they have identical eigenvalues. When you couple them, they will separate. Ah, exactly. What happens there? Yeah. So, when uh, individually all atoms will have the same level, but then when you have them coupled, it will separate into the energy bands. It is a similar phenomenon. Okay. And in this case, it is a second order system, but you can also try it with, let us say, 100th order system, which are all separated. They could all have the same pole values, but then when you couple them, let us say, with capacitors like this, they will bunch out and separate. Huh? Yeah, the difference becomes even more, I mean, you could start with the same value, even then they will become different, because one will move to a lower frequency, the other one will move to a higher frequency. Right. And this is known as pole splitting. Okay. So introducing a capacitor across the amplifier ends up splitting the poles. Splitting meaning, I mean they were they could be different to begin with, but 
one most higher frequency the other one most lower frequency they become even further apart uh, compared to each other and this also kind of tells you that uh, for somewhat significant values of cgd the approximation we made is good to begin with okay because how did we get the the basis of approximation was that the poles were far apart and this is actually making it further apart of course you can always find a value of cgd where it breaks down but if you have somewhat significant value of cgd they will be further apart and this is a very useful approximation okay any questions about any of this so with cgd we had something okay we had basically minus gmrl it can always be represented like this right where p1 and p2 we can find but now we found approximately okay so please catch the magnitude and phase response of this okay assume some values of p1 and p2 then do that So if you had a left half plane zero, it would give you a phase lead. Okay, I, all of you have uh, drawn the frequency. I mean phase response, assuming that it's a left half plane zero. A right half plane zero gives you a phase lag. Similarly, if you had a, the left half plane pole gives you a phase lag and right half plane pole give you a, gives you a phase lead, but there is no point drawing the phase response with the right half plane pole because such a system would be unstable and you can't uh, evaluate these things anyway. I mean you can evaluate it, but it's meaningless. What is the meaning of this magnitude and phase plots? What what does it uh, just say? So for instance, here. So this is for the case without CGD, and it would start with uh, phi, and fall off to zero. Okay, so this is the angle of V naught by V i. But what's the meaning of this plot? I have some transfer function v naught of s by v i of s. So what's the meaning of this plot? What does it say? What is what is it giving me? I know that if I substitute s equals j omega, I'll get some complex number, and this is the magnitude and phase of that. But how is it related to circuits and what we do with circuits? We apply signals and we get some signals out. Wow. Magnitude gain, magnitude of what? So what do you? So I have a system. With a transfer function h of s, I apply some vi, and I get some vo. And because I have nothing else to do, I keep asking you to draw magnitude and phase of h of s. Okay, but how is this related to? Let's say you go to the lab and you do this. I give you a box which is h of s. Okay, so now you, what will you measure to give me these plots? Sin theta, theta, theta. What is that? No, what what is the input? Huh? I mean, you have to measure the output, but what input will you apply, and what will you measure? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. What is it? What is the? So I give you a box with h of s, right? I, I made you draw all these plots, and you take the box to the lab. What will you measure to give me these same plots? What will you apply? What will you measure? Yes, spin up. Phase of what? So phase difference between? Yeah. So. What this tells you is, you apply a sinusoid, you wait for the system to reach steady state. That will anyway happen. Like when you turn on the power supply, turn on the function generator, take half an hour to do the experiments, then uh, this will the steady state thing will automatically happen as long as the system is stable. Okay, this is why the stability is important. I could draw magnitude and phase plots by having right half plane poles also, just by substituting s equals j omega. But that number will have no significance because if you do have that system. If you apply a sinusoid, what you get out after some time will not be another sinusoid. It will be the natural response of the system, which never dies out. Okay. So if you have a stable system, you apply a sinusoid, wait for it to reach steady state, and because it's a linear system, the output will be a sinusoid at the same frequency. The only thing that could have happened is that its phase is different from the input and magnitude is different from the input. So the what this gives you is the ratio of magnitudes at output and input. and what this gives you is the phase difference between input output and input okay
this is a this has both theoretical and practical utility right so we write it like this we can analyze frequency response and uh, uh, stability and all of those things it's very important and it's also a lot easier to measure than other uh, properties how would you describe a system what are alternative ways of describing this hfs what else could i specify to specify a system to describe a system impulse response okay how will you measure the impulse response you can't okay so you have to approximate the impulse with a narrow step and all of that stuff but even that won't work okay similarly you could apply a step response any one of them will work because it's a linear system if you know the output for one particular type of input let's say for an impulsive input or a step input or some other kind of input you can calculate the output for any other kind of input okay because it follows linearity but the problem is first of all in case of an impulse like how do you get an impulse it's just a theoretical entity but okay you could approximate it with a narrow pulse so the, what that's the lesser of the problems when you have measurement equipment first of all you will have some wire between the source and this and some other wire between this and oscilloscope or whatever way of uh, measurement you make okay even if you were able to generate a step or impulse here there is no guarantee that when it comes here it will be a step or impulse because the wire itself will have its own resistance capacitance inductance but the sinusoid cleans all that up right because if you apply a sinusoid here you will get a sinusoid of the same frequency as long as the wire is a linear system it is a linear system so that we don't have any problem the only thing is the magnitude here could be different from there but that's okay i go and measure it right here that is possible right similarly this also any uh, problems with this wire any signal changes because of this wire can also be corrected if it's a sinusoid because sinusoids are eigen vectors of uh, linear systems everywhere you will see sinusoids of the same frequency okay but so please understand what all these things mean properly okay so what we are plotting when we plot the frequency response is really the steady state ratio of the output to input amplitude in steady state and phase difference between output and input in steady state okay yes poles are not in the right half plane we have a stable system right i evaluated that okay again i messed up the notation but with this notation p1 and p2 will be positive okay so p1 will be plus this so that means it is in the left half plane the poles are at minus p1 and minus p2 with this particular notation where p1 and p2 are positive numbers okay is this fine so sorry i messed up the notation but uh, this is now how it's normally written initially i was evaluating the roots of the polynomial and i had uh, denoted p1 as the pole value but in this p1 is not the pole the pole is at minus p1 and minus p2 okay so anyway what happens with cgd to the magnitude response qualitatively on the same plot so this i have uh, drawn the magnitude and phase plot without cgd so now tell me how will the magnitude and phase plot look like with cgd let's start with the magnitude plot what happens at very low frequencies same as this one okay and after that where will the first pole be so you expect that first of all the pole without cgd was here so pole with cgd will be at some lower frequency okay so let's say i put it here and then it falls set this slope is minus 20 what is negative no no don't confuse the my, this is the x axis here is not the pole value okay so what is the x axis here frequency of the applied sinusoid okay now the poles will be negative in any stable system okay a high frequency poles means a more negative value okay not a, i mean it's not if you have a pole at minus 1 hertz and minus 100 hertz don't think of minus 1 hertz as the high frequency pole i mean you will be correct algebraically minus 1 is greater than minus 100 but that's not how people talk okay the point is high frequency pole means that the natural response because of it dies out quickly okay and that will happen the natural response due to the minus 100 hertz pole will die out more quickly than minus 1 hertz okay so again you have to get used to this notation i mean you can dispute it but you can't help it okay so when 
so strictly speaking i shouldn't say these break points happen at the poles it will happen at the negative of the poles or the absolute value of the poles okay because even in the original system the pole is not at the gs by cgs it's at minus gs by cgs and minus gl by cgs okay so now what happens as i go on increasing this i mean I go on increasing the frequency of the sign sir there will be a second pole and i expect that it will be at a higher frequency than this because the poles have split okay so let me draw it somewhere over there this is just some notation some uh, assumption here and then after that it will go to minus 40 and what happens after that you have a zero okay zero will turn the slope back to minus 20 okay is this fine what happens to the phase plot so first of all it starts falling sooner right it will do this and the way i have drawn it it will sorry not this way do this and it will say at uh, minus pi by 2 this is this is the phase shift due to p1 and due to p2 there will be another phase shift and due to the z1 there will be yet another minus 90 degrees phase shift okay so there will be a total phase shift of 3 pi by 2 total phase lag of 3 pi by 2 because of the two poles and the right half plane zero if you did have a left half plane zero then this phase would shift back up to plus 90 degrees okay but we have a right half plane zero so and this again is an important consideration when you think when you evaluate stability of feedback systems okay it turns out that zeros are quite useful in stabilizing feedback systems but not any zero a left half plane zero provides phase lead and right half plane zero will provide phase lag okay so you will later see that the left half plane zero improves stability because it's reducing phase lag which means it's somehow reducing the delay whereas the right half plane zero is increasing the delay okay is this fine so i have analyzed the frequency response of it again the pro the point is not getting the expressions that you can do with a little bit of effort okay interpreting it is very important because later we will also use it for designing some things okay and you will see systems like this everywhere i mean you have a control source and these three capacitors and different values of capacitors you have to figure out what happens okay so that kind of finishes the discussion on frequency response of the common source amplifier by itself okay so there will be two poles and because of cgd cgd can have an exaggerated effect especially in a high gain amplifier although the value of cgd is quite small okay so those are the uh, lessons to take home with a right half plane zero because of cgd there is pole splitting that is if you calculated the poles without cgd they will be at uh, some separation with cgd they will be at a greater separation okay so the cgd you can also think of as introducing feedback around the amplifier okay and it's because of the feedback that the conductance at the output node increases okay miller effect on cgd means that the 
input pole will be at a low frequency. Okay. Now, CGD goes on increasing, the input pole will move lower and the output pole will move higher to some extent. The output pole will move to higher frequencies to some extent. Okay. So, for now, all we need to know is that first of all, uh, we uh, designed the amplifier and we set the gain as minus GM RL without uh, any dependence on frequency. The only dependence on frequency we had earlier was because of the AC coupling capacitors. If you choose them to be large enough, then uh, you have no dependence on frequency, at least beyond its cutoff frequency. But it turns out that because of uh, parasitic capacitances, both due to the transistor and due to the rest of the circuit, you will have some dependence on frequency and in general you get this uh, second order response and in particular because of CGD you get a right half plane zero. Okay. And that is significant later. Okay. So now because earlier I said that to obtain a high gain, uh, we will cascade multiple amplifiers. Now you will see that when you, when you enclose that high gain in a negative feedback loop, what happens is there will be poles associated with each stage. Okay, you have to take those things also into account. So, what we will do next is to uh, discuss other kinds of biasing techniques and then go to feedback systems. Okay. But please think about all these things and it looks like many of you are rusty on this plotting uh, magnitude and phase plots and so on. These are all things done in EMC and networks and systems. Please go back and redo those exercises. It is not difficult. Like a couple of hours of work should get you on track. Okay.